make sure you have the right wheel studs otherwise your wheel may leave the car and that is never a fun time Welcome to the shop. I'm Jared and this is Wrench Every Day. Behind me is a car that you maybe have seen before if you watch some of the Tavares Rally videos. But it's making its first appearance here on Wrench Every Day. It's my 2008 Lexus ISF, and man is that black shining really great in the sun. So I'll be honest, it's not always uh, had that sparkle. It's got 220,000 miles, and the paint has been through a lot. But with my friend Mike at Dynamic Auto Spa, we spent some time detailing this thing and bringing all the life we can that's left in the paint. So, thanks to the editing magic of Dwayne, we're going to sparkle back in time, cover a detail real quick, and then let's jump back and introduce you to what is so special about the Lexus ISF. So the paint looks kind of terrifying with that soap drying on it. Mike, what, what soap are you using and why does it look like the paint's rotting away? Well, technically it's not the soap that's causing the paint. This is actually what's called CarPro Iron X. It's a product that's designed to dissolve any iron contamination that you would get from fallout, debris, anything you're gonna find in heavy industrial areas, northern zones. This will help dissolve it, get it off the surface of that way when I go to clay later on, all I'm doing is claying any actual fallout versus trying to get metal particles that can be actually embedded into the clear. She is washed and clay mitted, and uh, as you can tell, it had zero hydrophobic properties left. There is no wax. You can see uh, just it's sheeting water. Rather than sheeting off, it's just sheeting on it. Panel edge, the panel edge. So we will get it dried. The water is making it just reflect the sky beautifully. Um, once it's inside, we'll go around and talk about some of the defects we're going to have to work around. Of course, we'd like to thank Avalon King Armor Shield 9 for sponsoring today's video. They've been a continued partner of ours and we love having them back because it is a product we use and support fully. Armor Shield 9 is a DIY ceramic coating that you can apply to your own paint. After you've spent all this time buffing and polishing and making your car look amazing, it'd be a shame to trust it to normal wax. Armor Shield 9 is a nano ceramic coating. After applying it to your paint, it dries into a hardened invisible shield, keeping chemicals, water, and other debris from harming that paint. One other fun use of it is restoring tired plastic. If you've got some weathered, dull looking plastic, the ceramic coating does an amazing job of bringing back a lot of life to the plastic. You can spend thousands of dollars going to a professional dealer to have a ceramic coating applied, or you can buff and polish your car and apply your own ceramic coating and save hundreds if not thousands of dollars. If you'd like to get your own kit and be protected by the king, use our code WRENCH to save $25 off your kit. And with our continued partnership with Avalon King, we're gonna have several more videos where we're trying to come up with fun different ways to test just how tough their ceramic coating is. If you've got any ideas of what you'd like to see us apply it to, or maybe even a little torture test of it, leave it in the comments below. And now let's get back to detailing. Now that we're inside, we can uh, accurately show how terrible that hood is. I mean, it's, it's had a rough life. You know, we've got staining in the paint, so we're gonna see how much sap, how much of just all of this that we can come out. So we've got a lot of work to do. So we're gonna set up some cameras and start going along with the detail. And when Mike wants to uh, share a quick tip and trick, we'll cut in with that. <laughs> making some progress and uh, we're coming up across anytime you're going to buff or work your own paint 
if you find any type of defect like this, this is a blister. So if you were to come across with the buffing wheel, since there's a crack, it would hook that and potentially rip and flake the whole paint up. So a very simple but common sense trick is to take your tape. You just basically want to go over where the crack itself is. You don't want to put too much pressure because depending on how bad the blister is, you could run the chance of pushing it down. So when I pull the tape up later on, I could essentially pull up when I break down. So this is kind of just a way, while you won't be getting any polishing done here and you will see it in the paint, it's kind of one of those things, better safe than sorry. You can either have it polished or you can have it completely removed. So we're gonna err on the side of not having it look any worse than it already is. isopropyl alcohol wiped down in preparation for the ceramic coating. Now, if you were gonna wax the car with a more traditional wax, would you still take this step to strip it bare before you put a coating down or would you go straight into waxing? Normally you can, it would not hurt your waxing or sealing. It would just give you a better surface. All this step essentially doing is, is we're ensuring there's no oil, silicones, anything that may have transferred or filled from the polish. We're just ensuring nothing's there, cleaning off any debris, dirt, dust that might've gotten on the panel because obviously we want the cleanest, best service to lock in. If, we, if there was fillers, if there were silicones or anything left on the paint, oils, the ceramic coating would actually bond to that. And as I'm wiping it up, it would not actually bond to the clear. So doing this ensures that you are getting a clear, nice stripped surface. And exactly what is, you're seeing is what the ceramic coating is coating. So again, it just boils down to, and why I am not always the best at detailing, every little step all these tiny little details matter all right mike is working on polishing out those tips and that looks phenomenal but that's a very boring looking polish for your metal so uh, should, shouldn't you have some really fancy exotic carnuba metal polish so there is a lot of very high grade people will sell off as being the top polish the, or top metal polish top metal compounds all these very high grade ones. Surprisingly, in all the years, I've been doing this for a decade and a half. The best poly metal polish I've ever found, surprisingly, comes from Walmart. Blue Magic Metal Polish Cream, mixed with 4-0 steel wool, turns you, can actually give you some of the best finish for an exhaust. These tips are, what, over 200,000 miles on yep. them? So that's a lot of burn tip, a lot of Jared's driving to it. You see the difference between left and right? So that's... Five After. minutes worth of work. And uh, not so shiny. You can see a little bit where it got buffed with the uh, buffer as he's working around, but. And that stuff will give you an insane finish on an exhaust, on wheels, anything, any type of metal that's uncoated, that polish right there will absolutely kill it and give you a very high gloss shine for it. We were trying to get everything done in time to catch golden hour, which was about 30 minutes ago. Yeah. It still came out looking amazing. The reflection, I love, love a good looking black car. I just hate the uh, effort that it takes to do it. The ceramic coating is curing still. There's a little bit more to come from it. We're gonna be able to take this home and get it in a garage, but look at that shine. Mike, thank you. I have wow. none of those talents and you did a fantastic job of it. Speaking of coatings, what right. is your verdict on Avalon King? All right, so for a one to two year DIY product that anybody can do, if you can achieve good detailing, good polishing results, it's a phenomenal coating to work with. Comparably to the one years, which I don't generally offer one year as much because for my market, obviously 
not my market, but for any one time somebody wants me to do one year, I would actually use this coating. The I tested in every form from doing it for a single minute on a panel to minute and a half, two minutes, doing two panels, doing three panels at a time. Every single test, it was the same all the way around. It was simple to apply, it wiped off easily, it cleaned up simply, and you see the final results. So I would have to say for all my testing of doing this for almost 10 years and just ceramic coatings for 10 years, hands down one of the easiest, best looking, easiest to apply one to two year coatings that I have used. So we've got a few more cosmetic upgrades to go for the Lexus. So we are going to jump back into the future now over at site B and show you those upgrades. So now that we've got you guys caught up on the process of bringing our 220,000 mile daily driver's looks back up to uh, par to match some of its performance, let's talk a little bit about what exactly that F means. The F comes from Lexus's internal moniker for flagship. And if you look at the design of the F, that looks like a famous corner from the Fuji Motor Speedway where Lexus does almost all of their performance brand testing. In 2006, the F internal mark and brand was made as official part of Lexus. Similar to the BMW M series, the AMGs, the performance from the luxury cars. The Lexus ISF comes equipped with a direct and port injection V8, the 2UR GSE engine, making 416 crank horsepower. I have everything but the supercharger on this car. Got long tube headers, I've got a full exhaust, we've got this awesome R Racing carbon fiber intake with larger mass airflow meter housing, the upgraded air filter, air oil separator, because on the track these things will kind of fling around and can suck some of the oil into the intake and will start smoking a lot. I love having this thing on the road course, I actually drove it. 750 miles, competed in a three-day time attack event, and drove it all the way back home. Uh, results weren't as good as I had hoped. I saw Street Mod as the class entered it, and it turns out Street Mod is a uh, gentle way of saying cheap race cars. So, a little bit outclassed, didn't have the right tire, couldn't get the right tire, but we made do. And when comparing it with a normal second generation IS250 or IS350, one of the things that stands out the most is how much broader the front end of the car is. It has much broader fenders. There's a nice big bump in the hood that's kind of hard to tell in the black. You have these aggressive but functional fender vents and all of it is just to fit and keep that big V8 engine cool. What's really neat is the previous generation, the IS300, which was a small tight well handling chassis which they carried on in the second generation it served as a test bed where this engine was shoved into that very small car more signs that this is meant to be on the track and driven very hard are those are massive brake cooling ducts now you want massive brake cooling when you have brakes that are surprisingly huge for as small as this car is it's amazing how big the brakes are on this car. Some of the other really cool features or unknown facts, I guess, about the F brand and the LFAs and just the entire F family is a lot of the Toyota Supra engineers found themselves without much to do when the Supra was discontinued. So they transferred over to Lexus and had a hand in tuning the suspension, tuning the brakes, tuning this engine, and turning it into such an awesome and unknown car. One of the big pushes for the ISF was they were kind of tired of all the auto magazines making fun of them for never having a proper answer to the M series from BMW. Now it's hard to say, honestly, if it is every bit of an M3 or greater, just because it was Lexus's first shot at putting something this crazy together. If you really look at all of their previous cars, their comfort cars or luxury cars, they're not a performance car. What I love most about driving this every day is nobody knows what it is. Less than 12,000 globally, I think less than 5,500 are ever sold in the United States. It's just a fun car to drive around that has a ton of power that people don't know about. Hey guys, Dwayne the editor here. I just had to jump in at this point because um, 
Well, because I can. I'm the editor after all, and I can kind of do what I want here. But uh, anyway, I have to agree with Jared on a couple of points he just made. Back a couple of years ago when Jared first bought his ISF, and I saw it, I loved it. I had no idea what it was, but I really, really loved it, and I wanted one. And so Jared uh, tracked down a 2008 Matador Red Mica ISF in Memphis, Tennessee, and I bought it and have absolutely loved driving it ever since. So here's a question for you. What color of ISF do you like best? Do you like Jared's ISF that's plain and black? Or do you like my stunning and gorgeous red one? What do you think? Let me know. Inside, you've got the nice sporty dash, eight speed automatic transmission with a direct drive torque converter. It basically goes into full lockup as soon as you come out of first gear, which is a lot of fun. Hits really hard. Navigation, you know, just everything you would expect from a 2008 car. That would be a uh, pure saddle because Pira does get to uh, jump in the back of the Lexus but uh, given her new size as she keeps growing she's kind of running out of room back there. We've got the look going a lot better with the polished paint. Everything you know the tent car looks good except the factory wheels are uh, they're tired. They've not uh, had the best care before I got a hold of them. Somebody decided to powder coat the wheels the same Brembo orange as the brake calipers and I hated the way it looks. I just very quickly hit it with some antique bronze and that paint is uh, now separating. So let me go grab something that we got for this car that I think is going to look absolutely amazing. And there we go. The brand new Koenig countergrams. Something I've done that's uh, somewhat common with the ISFs but you don't see too frequently is convert to an 18 inch wheel and going to a square setup, meaning the front and rears are gonna be the same size. Right now, they're staggered with some pretty small front tires and okay rear tires. And when it comes to tire, there's really, in my opinion, for a daily sports car, not much better than the Michelin Pilot Sport 4S's. We've got the set. These are actually, three of them are the ones from uh, Tavarish's 3000 GT with one brand new one, uh, that blowout couldn't quite uh, make use of that tire. But I want to go ahead, let's jack this car up and see if we can't uh, fit these wheels and talk a little bit about wheel fitment and some of the measurements and numbers you're going to need to know when getting a set of wheels. And there we are with the initial test fit. I think that's looking pretty good. I was expecting to actually have to space out a little bit, but I think it may be all right. We'll have to actually mount the wheel on and lower it down to see. Now, when we're talking about spacers, there's a lot that goes into rim size and rim fit than you might think. One of the most important numbers is what is called offset. What it refers to is where that mounting face is based on a center line of the wheel. So dead center of the wheel, this is either out or in from that point. Wheel spacers end up being a slightly controversial subject. Some people say never run them, but the right kind can be used if they're used correctly. So with this spacer here, I wouldn't advise running this on factory wheel studs because you need to have a certain amount of thread engagement on your lug nuts and this is taking 10 millimeters away from that. When you start going 15 millimeter or larger they'll have offset studs where you will bolt this to your factory wheel studs and they have their own studs built in that your wheel bolts on. So depending on the application as long as you're not extreme horsepower that is a good acceptable way to get proper wheel fitment. You also have what's called bore size and hub size. So the factory Lexus wheels are that smaller, 67 I think it is, and then the Koenigs come with a 73. So these will also function as hub-centric spacers, 
mounting nice and secure on the factory hub and then giving the correct hub diameter for our aftermarket wheel. So what we're going to go ahead and do, we might get to fit these wheels. We're going to bolt those on and see how it ends up looking. That fit up pretty stinking good. So we're going to move on and uh, test fit that rear now. Now when we're talking about not wanting to use this style spacer without longer wheel studs, so when we mount this thing up, which I'm not going to hammer too much down because it is a tight fit there, you can see how much little there is for your wheel nuts to be able to grab and adhere to. So you really need to be careful. Make sure you have the right wheel studs, otherwise your wheel may leave the car and that is never a fun time. We are fully on the ground and set. So ISF people, I'll put the part number for these Koenigs if you wanna get your own set of 18 inch squares and uh, know what you can do to get them fitted. We're now 265 squared all the way around where before, again, we ran 255s in the rear 225s in the front so we're going to substantially more rubber with uh, something that doesn't look so uh, crackly I'm gonna go ahead and finish putting these wheels on get them torqued up and our Koenig center caps on move to the other side and I'm gonna show you one other cosmetic upgrade now we're big on uh, questionable choices but again this is uh, potentially a little too questionable for a street car but it looks absolutely absurd back here. What this is, is an AeroMotions active rear wing. So it's just sitting on there. The angle of attack is wrong because it is all controlled by cables and a motor assembly that would mount to that trunk lid. What it does is as you uh, enter a corner, it can flex one side of this up. When you stand hard on the brakes, it will come up and stand and give you a giant air brake just like a supercar or hypercar, you know, like the insane, insane stuff. But I think, I think it's a little too extreme for a daily driver. Um, I kind of had my heart set on doing it and then uh, setting it up there. I think it might be a little bit too much, but uh, go ahead and drop your comments, your opinions, and uh, let me know what you think about the big monstrous swing back there and if it's something we should do on our street car. But uh, yeah. So we're uh, coming to the close of the cosmetic updates on my daily driver ISF. Eh, mostly the wife's daily driver. I try to get it whenever I can and take it on road rallies where we've gone ahead and cleaned, buffed the paint. We've got those new awesome Koenig wheels fitted and maybe a wing, probably not a wing. Next time on the ISF daily driver build, we're gonna jump into a lot of the mechanical needs it has. 220,000 miles, I'm gonna go ahead and put new wheel bearings on it. We're going to check the suspension over, which is already tight, but always put eyes on it. We've got to do some valve cover gaskets and some just other small little maintenance. So join me next time as we cover that. I'm Jared, reminding you to always make questionable choices and big wings, maybe not always. We'll see you next time.